So good morning everyone and welcome to this webinar. This webinar is about virtual presentations and it's how you as a trainer or a facilitator or a presenter and even a keynote speaker, how you can get your information to people without necessarily being in the room and it provides it provides several advantages. It enables you to, you know, present information to places where you may not be able to get to or at times where you may not be available. It also enables you to, I guess, leverage your, your content so you can, you can capture your content in different formats and it enables people to view or access your format in their own home. So lots of advantages in being able to do effective virtual presentations. This workshop or this webinar came about because I work quite a bit with different agencies that help people with disabilities and some physical disabilities and some intellectual disabilities and sometimes these people have very passionate and important messages but they're not always able to get out and about to the various city councils to the various forums that need their information. So how can they capture that that passion and their intellectual property, their content, and share it with the audiences if they're not able to be there? So that's kind of the genesis of where this virtual presentations webinar first came from. A little bit about myself. There are some new names on the list. So Peter Jew is my name. I'm a public speaking trainer and coach and I love to help people find their voice so they can effectively and confidently share their message to those groups, to those people who need to hear the message. If you haven't done webinars before, just a quick way of how to participate and please ask questions as we go. So two ways to ask questions. At any stage you can type in the question box and I will see that question and I will answer it straight away if it's appropriate or I may park it and answer it just a bit later on if I'm going to reach that content. So do ask questions. Uh, the other way is if you raise your hand and I'm looking at most of the attendees, most of you have got microphones, if you raise your hand I will open up your microphone and you can ask the question. Um, please do ask questions because that helps to make the webinar interactive. I don't want to be the only person who talks so please do ask questions. Put suggestions forward, uh, even your own ideas or your own experiences, feel free to share those during the webinar. Uh, feel free to take notes as we go and what's really important I think is to Try and apply the information. So think about the material as I share it with you. Could have you used this in the past or what would have you been able to do differently in the past? Or let's say you've got something coming up and I know there's someone on this webinar who's, who is conducting a webinar in the future and wants to learn some information around webinars. So how can you apply this knowledge or this tool that I'm sharing with you to something you want to do in the future? So Please participate, ask questions, take notes, think and apply to your own situation. Okay. Just moving forward. So first things first, whether you are presenting in person or whether you're going to do a recording or a virtual presentation, make sure you are clear of what your core message is and what your core purpose is. So it's still a mini presentation, it's still a speech. So the same way you'd go about preparing a speech, what message do I want these people to walk away with and what is the purpose? Why is it important to this audience to hear this information? Have clarity around that. If you don't have clarity then the effect you have on the audience could be varied. So if you don't know which road you're going down or which road you want to help and assist your audience going down, it could be that they go down the wrong path. So please, even though you're presenting virtually, still do the same steps that you would do 
as if you were presenting live face to face with this audience. Have clarity around your purpose and clarity around your message. So some types of virtual presentations you can do. The first one, and you're participating in one right now, is of course the webinar. You can also do podcasts. So with a podcast, you record your voice and then people can download it on their on iTunes, they can put it on their phone, they can listen to it on their on their computer, and all they hear is your voice. So podcast is just creating an audio recording of your voice and then making it available in different formats. And I will explain all of these as we go. YouTube videos. You can just record yourself presenting and make it available on YouTube. Then you can provide the link to that recording, that five tips to overcome nerves, those five tips to make sure your voice is warmed up and effective before speaking. And you can put that on the YouTube, that video, and then your clients or people can find that and can watch that YouTube in their own time. Skype sessions. You can use virtual presenting via Skype. And I often do one-on-one -on -one coaching or I have a support group that I help other people who stutter where we do one, two, maybe eight people via Skype sessions. So that enables me to be in my room and reach people around West Australia and support them and coach them without me needing to be there. And there are other uh, ways you can go further with, with larger audiences, but you then need to start to pay money if you go above the eight or nine. Your slides. The slides from this PowerPoint presentation, I can now put them on a software sharing site called SlideShare. And people can look at my PowerPoint slides from a workshop, from a webinar, from a virtual presentation, and they can view them in their own time. So that's called SlideShare. Besides podcasts, which are generally downloadable onto your iPhone or your smartphone, you can also do audio recording that you can make available um, in CDs or other formats. And of course, you can do video recording and you can create a video and make that available. Um, all of these types of virtual virtual presenting also come together and enable you to put together a virtual course. So you might record five lots of webinars or five lots of podcasts and then also provide a workbook and all of a sudden they've got a five five-step virtual course on how to do A, B, C or D. So there are some of the ways that you can do virtual presenting. I just mentioned that I'd been to a conference in America and they used they used holograms. So they basically beamed a person, a three-dimensional person on stage who participated live. They could see and hear the 1,500 people in the audience and they spoke and they played a musical instrument. And as far as we could tell, that person was was almost really on the stage. It was really difficult to realise they were a hologram except every now and then they would click their fingers and the hologram would disappear. Then they'd click their fingers and the hologram would come back. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so webinars. There are a range of webinar platforms and I've put these up here for you. The one that I use is GoToWebinar. I use, I use GoToWebinar because it's very easy to use. Uh, I'm not very technological savvy. So GoToWebinar is very easy to use. I can record the webinar. I can I can make the recording available. Uh, I can share multiple screens on my my computer. The Microsoft Office Live Meeting, you can also use that one. I think this one is free for a small number. Uh, the Adobe Acrobat uh, Connect Pro is also fairly good. 
it is not as expensive as GoToWebinar. So it's really up to you to work out to work out why you uh, or which webinar software you want to use. And most of them will give you a trial. So before you sort of sign up, you just apply for a 30-day trial with GoToWebinar and see how it goes. Now, GoToMeeting is one below GoToWebinar and that is at a cheaper price. And then you have GoToWebinar and then you have GoToTraining, which enables you to package and put the train together. Can you do a webinar with a small group using GoToMeeting? Um, I don't use GoToMeeting and I'm not, share, not sure how much of your screen that you can share. So if you can share your PowerPoint slides or your keynote slides on GoToMeeting, then you should be able to use it for webinars. Whether you can record it or not, I don't know. I haven't used GoToMeeting, but it is uh, the baby brother of GoToWebinar and is cheaper. So if you've got, if you're already running GoToMeeting, why not send a, send an email to Citrix. Citrix is the company that runs uh, GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar and GoToTraining. So yeah, so GoToMeeting has a limit of 28 people according to some people that are sending information. And GoToWebinar has, a, um, has no limit. So you can do a thousand people. And Google Hangouts is also free for, uh, for virtual webinars if you want to use Google Hangouts. So this is not an exhaustive uh, system, but there are a range of platforms that you can use to run a webinar. So Google Hangouts. Uh, I think to have Google Hangouts and to participate, everyone must sign up to Google Plus or, or have a Google account and, and that's easy to do. Anyone can grab a, a Gmail account. Not anymore. Okay, Google Hangouts, please feel free to go away and explore using Google Hangouts. Just erasing the drawings and moving forward. So I was going to pause for question and answers, but I've had a whole host of questions. So the webinar platform that you use is entirely up to you. Uh, there are expensive ones and there are free ones. So by all means, explore your own webinar platform. And one of the beauties is you can, and I guess what I did before I started doing my webinars, I practice with a few friends. So it's easy to get two or three friends on and just practice and do different slide formats. Any more questions? So webinars are a really powerful tool and more and more People and organisations are using webinars, especially people that have got offices interstate. Um, I will talk more about webinars. I'm going to talk about audio recordings. And it can be really simple to do an audio recording. And that audio recording, so I am recording this webinar. It will have the video and it will also, the PowerPoint slides and also the audio. I can take the audio out and I can make a podcast, but podcasts generally are short and sweet. So, you know, five to six minutes for a podcast, just the tip of the day or, or three quick steps to get ready to do whatever you're, you're coaching or training in. You could then burn it into an audio CD and make a CD available. Um, I have a CD on how to write a killer speech that I provide to those people who participate in some of my workshops and I've also got that recording on my website so people can access that how to write a killer speech, the recording, they can also access, access that via my website. And another concept of course is the audio blog. Um, blogging is becoming very, very popular and where you write some information and 
those people subscribe to your blog, well, they can subscribe to an audio blog. People think that audio recording has to be really complicated, and that's not really the case. Um, you can use just a digital recorder, which I use, which is an Olympus. You can get these for about $100, $120, and they record for hours and hours, so I can record an entire workshop. I use this for my podcasting, and I have a microphone uh, that I can pin to my lapel, and I just speak for five or six minutes, and then I convert it to a podcast. I can then convert it to an audio CD. Uh, I can convert that audio CD to a manual or an online course, so I might have uh, 10 tips to get ready to prepare a webinar and it'll be 10 different podcasts or 10 tracks on an audio CD. And of course I can then record an entire workshop. One of the workshops I did in Melbourne went for six hours and I recorded the entire workshop. I can now repurpose that and I can use it again and again and again. And someone who missed out on that workshop, I can provide them the recording. So multiple ways that you can use that recording. You can use your iPhone to be record to, to do your recordings, to do your audio blogs. When you interview someone, you can just use your iPhone. You don't need to have these fancy uh, $500 microphones with those pop filters unless you want to go really professional. And some some professional podcasters do have you know those boom microphones with the with the pop filters. So let's say you're doing a series of interviews, and you might decide to interview five or six experts in your field, and you have just a conversation with them, and you record them, and all of a sudden you put together a podcast series, um, five tips from job interviews five tips for job interview skills from human resource managers and just interview five of your friends that work in HR and just get them to give their three or four tips of how people can get ready for job interviews. And then each HR manager will have different experience and give different tips. You've now got a audio series, an audio recording that you can repurpose, you can, you can publish as a podcast, you can burn to a CD. When you do your recording, you can use uh, free software called Audacity, and I'm sure there's other software as well. And you can use this to edit your recording. So if there's some material that that sounds not quite appropriate, you could edit that out using Audacity. If there's the person you're interviewing has lots of ums and ahs, or they have a I suppose a period where they lose their way, you can edit that piece out. If you are editing someone else's presentation, someone else's speaking, you need to get permission and then get them to sign off on the edited version that you're presenting. But what I use Audacity mostly for is for putting an introduction and an outro or outroduction or a beginning and an end. So every podcast that I do has a small introduction and and the closing section which takes you back or reiterates my website and how to contact me if you need further information. So you don't need to buy buy software for editing your, your audio. So about three or four weeks ago a friend of mine in Perth who's likes to have a coffee once a week with someone interesting. He invited me to have a coffee with him and he recorded that one hour conversation. He wrote a little transcript and he published it on his website. And his website's called A Coffee with a Beatboxer and you can Google that. And so each week his aim is to have 52 coffees, 52 conversations in a year. And he looks for people that are you know, quite interesting or have some form of form of interesting story to tell and he decided to interview me. 
So that's how you can share your audio content. It can be you speaking, you can record yourself on an iPhone, you can record one of your presentations, or you can just sit down in front of your computer and do an audio recording. And then you share that information uh, with one or two people or with many people. Someone likes the idea of a coffee with a beatboxer. And one of the things that I like to do is, and I guess the same thing with my blog, is that I speak to other people who also work in the speaking and the presentation skills industry. So I don't know everything about public speaking. And there's other ways of looking at things. So when I speak to these people, I sometimes then share their content. And another thing I do is I will, for my blog, I will put someone else's blog. And of course, I acknowledge that it's that person's blog and this is their point of view. So it's really, it's a good way to share knowledge and allow other people to get that as well. So the question was, how did the uh, beatboxer, and his name is Sam, Samuel Wise, Sam used his iPhone. So we, we were at a coffee shop in Perth called the Dome, um, Dome Coffee Shop. It's, it's one of the coffee shop changes, chains, and he just put his iPhone down in front and just asked me questions and spoke. Someone's asking about teleconferencing. Um, I don't do teleconferencing per se, but I certainly know that when you're doing webinars, it's important to almost act as if you're in the room and if it's live. And those people who were on the webinar early would have heard me uh, walking around, not walking around, uh, talking to people, just having a little bit of a chat. And that would be my meet and greet that I do with people before I walk into the webinar so or walk into the presentation so any tips for teleconference dynamics so that more people participate and ask questions yeah I really don't have any any tips on that if people don't want to engage uh, then one asks why why they're there it depends if teleconference, if people are there because they're required to be there, it's completely different dynamics. When you're doing virtual presenting, all you, all you people are on the webinar because you wish to be on the webinar. I'm hoping none of you have been told you must attend this webinar. So my level of participation and questions are flying left, right and centre uh, is really high because you want to get some information out of me. Sometimes teleconferences, and when I worked for the Health Department of WA, sometimes teleconferences were boring, were uninteresting, and they were just ticking off the box. They were just compliant. So make sure people that are on your teleconference want to be there and the content is relevant. So remember my first slide. What is the key message or what is the key discussion and, and what is the purpose? And if it serves no purpose for some of the people on the teleconference, they probably won't participate. That's probably the best I can speak on in terms of teleconferencing. Video conferencing has been mentioned and then you'll see facial expressions. So maybe video conferencing will be more engaging. Look, I'm not really sure. But thanks for the question, Colleen. Um, if you find out more about how to do engaging teleconferences, please, please let me know and I can maybe write a blog about it. So coffee with a beatboxer. Really cool idea. So that audio that you record and I record, I can then convert to a podcast that I then put on iTunes. And if you go to my iTunes account and so I think it's iTunes Peter Jew, you can download these onto your iPod or your iPhone or your smartphone for free. I can also charge for these, but they are free. Let me just 
quickly take you to my website and I will share I will share some of my podcasts. So as you look at my website, you go across the top. I also have a blog, but my podcasts you can click on those and you can you can hear them through the computer. Or alternatively, you can subscribe to my podcast for free. So that's just another way of sharing the audio with a wider audience. Another way of being able to present virtually. Let me go back to the PowerPoint slides. So just another way of getting that audio, that information, that content out to people and making it into a now a transportable way so they can be walking doing their exercise and they can be listening to the meeting minutes. They can be listening to your tips. Uh, they can be listening to affirmations depending on what you do. So this is just using an audio component to virtually present to people with you out without you necessarily being in the room. And this can come from, from content you've just purposely recorded or it can be from a webinar or it can come from a workshop that you've now repurposed. Any questions? Video recording. Really easy to video record also. Most, most cameras, and certainly my camera, that will take a digital recording. Use your webcam. And if you do Skype, then clearly you have a webcam. And just by using those those simple pieces of equipment, you can record a five minute video. And that video can be on tips, that video can then be shared via a blog. And they're saying that video blogging is becoming more and more powerful because they see those facial expressions. Uh, you can demonstrate material with your face and with your hands. and people not only see the voice but they see your face. So I've mentioned blogging, I've mentioned audio blogs, but video blogs are the way that social marketers are suggesting we need to go, the way to go. So video record yourself and your iPhone once again. You can record yourself with the iPhone. I saw something really interesting at the conference in the United States and I can't expand very much on this. People were walking around with their iPhones on an extended um, pole. So the pole was held in the hand, just think of a broomstick, but it was more like a telescopic one so it would you know, almost shrink down to the size of a, a biro. They'd extend it and they'd have their iPhone clamped and they'd face it towards themselves or they'd face it towards other people. Plugged into their iPhone, they had a proper audio microphone. You know when you watch news and the, the journalists go out in the field and they push a big microphone in front of the person they're interviewing's face. Well, this person had a microphone like that plugged into their iPhone. And they were interviewing people and obviously recording and as they recorded the person they would put the microphone in front of the person's uh, mouth and then they'd ask another question so they're doing live interviews out in the field at this conference and lots of interesting people um, you know for Mr Forbes from Forbes magazine um, a Fortune 500 you know was speaking and presenting at this conference so what a great way to uh, capture this content and share it. So they were doing almost television quality recording using their iPhone. Don't ask me about that. Don't ask me how to use it, uh, where you get it from. Obviously within the United States, uh, you know, they have 
this advanced equipment a lot sooner than we do, but it just shows you what you can do. It just shows you what you can do. So use a digital camera. Use your webcam. I sometimes do recordings, especially when I'm talking about nonverbal communication and I'm coaching people. I'll record um, the frozen hand gesture and then I'll share that with that person I'm coaching so they get the idea of when you speak, you make a gesture. When you pause, you freeze the hand your smartphones, your iPhones, and you can get a professional to record a presentation. Some of the conferences that I have spoken at, there has been a professional uh, photographer there, and the conference organiser is making the recording, but you can speak to the, uh, the camera person, and, and maybe he needs an extra $100, and he will provide you with just a copy of your portion of the conference or if you speak to the conference organiser or the meeting organiser they may make that recording available. Um, one thing you should have which I don't have at the moment is almost like a like a biography but a video biography so four or five um, little bits of recording from different presentations, different trainings, different keynotes you've done merged together in a short collage, three to five minutes, of you presenting. So that material is really good when you're marketing. If someone's going to um, hire you or wants to know a little bit more about you, they often would like to see some video of you presenting. So another reason to capture your content. So you can do a whole, a whole presentation virtually and then make it available to people that wish to view that topic. So another way of virtually sharing your content. So we've done the webinar, we've done the video recording, we've done the we've done the uh, the webinar, the video, and the audio. Now I've just lost my screen for a moment. Just want to check that you've still got it. Yes, you do. And so let's talk about repurposing the content. Let's add value to the content. Some of you might want to make some money out of what you do. And how about creating some new products? And all virtually. So what you can do in terms of repurposing your content, let's take this webinar. Let's take this webinar that I'm now presenting. What I can do is I can put the recording on YouTube. In fact, I will put the recording on YouTube. So if there's some content that we've skipped over a little bit quickly or you want to review any of the material, send me an email and I will make it available to you on YouTube. I can do an online course. Uh, some of you have attended my one-day presentation skills workshop. During December this year, uh, because not many people do workshops in December, I did a first. I ran a series of five one-hour webinars that covered the entire content of the one-day workshop. So my one-day workshop runs for, uh, for seven hours, but I get people presenting. So if you strip out a couple of hours of the presentations, really the content goes for five hours. So I did five one-hour webinars. I recorded those webinars. I then transcribed everything on the webinar into my workbook, into an ebook, and then people purchased this online course. They've got the webinar recording, they've got the PowerPoint slides, and they've got the workbook. So you can repurpose the webinar. You can post your slides to SlideShare. SlideShare is free PowerPoint sharing software or Keynote if you use Keynote sharing software. Let me just show you my website once again. So I'm just going to change change platforms. So let me go to my website first. And if you look across the top, you'll see my Facebook, my Twitter, my YouTube, and that is SlideShare. When you click on SlideShare, these are my PowerPoint slides that I've now put on the domain, on the free domain for people to watch. And this is one of those, uh, those online courses. So it was five times webinar across five different dates. And people can now watch my slides, use my slides for free. 
I've now made that available. I can password protect this and make this available only to my clients or I can put it in the public domain. So I'm now sharing my content. I'm sharing five times one hour webinars free virtually to a wider audience. So that's uh, SlideShare. One word, slideshare.com. You are able to put PowerPoint slides there. So any of your content that you've created for workshops, for presentations, for training, you can put it on SlideShare and just send people, send future clients, potential clients, past clients, send them the link and they can go through the slides in their own pace. There's no audio with SlideShare. It's just the PowerPoint slides. Let me just go back to the PowerPoint presentation. So that's SlideShare. I can strip the audio, so just the sound from the webinar, and I can create a podcast or a CD or I can break it up into an audio blog. Once again, an audio blog should be fairly sharp, five to six minutes. So a one-hour webinar, I wouldn't post the whole recording. But if there's aspects that I can strip out using Audacity, then I can pick different chunks and I can break that down into an audio blog or an audio course. So the online course, this online course is complete. It's got the slides, uh, the audio, the visual and the workbook. But maybe you can do just an online course or tips just with the audio. And finally, get someone to convert the written document or the written content. Sorry, let, get someone to convert the spoken content to a written document. You can use uh, websites like Elance or Guru.com or Freelancer and you can ask someone, uh, I've got one hour of audio recording and I'd like that one hour converted to a uh, text. Some people will use speech recognition software like DragonWrite and other people will just go through the audio and convert it to the written word. They give you that document back, you tidy it up a little bit. Now you've got an e-book or a workbook or a written document that you can now share or put into a newsletter or put into a written blog. So this one webinar I've now converted into five or six different formats to share virtually with my audience, with my followers, uh, with my current clients, with potential clients, with people that maybe want a sample of my work. I've now got it available to share in multiple formats. I can also sell my online course or I can give it away for free. So I'm also monetizing some of my content. So repurposing your content. So now that you've recorded it, there's several ways you can share it virtually. Whether you've video recorded it or audio recorded it, you can still share it. SlideShare, so I've just mentioned SlideShare. You can use it for PowerPoint. You can use it for uh, Keynote, which is Apple's presentation software. And some of you may have heard of Prezi, P -R -E ZI, Prezi is uh, quite an interesting presentation software that you can use as well. All of those formats can be shared via SlideShare. Any questions? I'm just going to pause for a moment. Yes, uh, Brenton, I'll just open up your microphone. Yes, Brenton, you've got a question. Are you there, Brenton? No, you've got your hand up, Brenton, and I've opened up your microphone. Um, just type your question in. I can't. I can't ascertain whether your microphone's working. Nope. No questions. Okay. So repurposing your content again, so this time record a workshop. So I mentioned that I wore my digital recorder during a seven hour workshop, which I presented live to a group of 15 people. 
So once again, I can send off the audio to Elance or to Guru. Um, guys, you can get this done really cheap because these Elance contractors are all around the world and they may be in uh, Eastern Europe, they may be in the Philippines, uh, they may be in India. India's level of English is really, really good. Uh, their English is superb and it'll cost you $50, maybe $60 to convert maybe one hour of spoken word to an ebook. So the question that uh, Brenton's asking is around intellectual property and if I can just seek if I can just seek clarification, uh, Brenton, are you saying have I had any problems with people taking my IP and reusing it and sort of stealing my content and stealing my material? Am I concerned about if I put stuff out there, then my IP will be lost or be used by other people? Is that is that the YouTube blocking my account? I've never had YouTube block my account. So if you use someone else's material, yeah, no, I haven't had any YouTube blocking my account. So all my content I create myself. Um, so I don't know why they would block my account. Can you expand on this a little bit more in terms of YouTube blocking my content or blocking your account. Is it if it's if you're using someone else's material or is it if you're putting in appropriate material? Uh, Brenton. Okay, if the sound in the background is copyright then you are blocked. Okay, I mean, say a TV is going in the background. Yeah, look, my I guess my response to that is that um, certainly with my recording, I don't have anything going in the background, so there wouldn't be any TV. Um, my music, I've got some intro music and some outro music for my CD. Um, that was written for me by a friend, so I own the copyright on that. And also I have an APRA license, so whenever I use any music, I'm using it under license. So if YouTube did block me, I would certainly let them know that I have a right to use that music. And also one thing with imaging, yeah, look, I've had no problem with YouTube blocking any of my content, so um, that's something new. and. Yeah, I don't know how YouTube can block unlicensed music because so many musicians are discovered via YouTube. So they're new musicians. I've, I've watched so many um, New Zealanders put really interesting music on YouTube. So I haven't experienced blocking. In terms of images, uh, images you use in PowerPoint, make sure that you purchase the images and you can use iStockphoto or depositphoto.com. Uh, iStockphoto.com and you pay a dollar fifty or two dollars per image and then you have the license to use it. It's they're royalty free images so you don't have to pay royalties and but that is interesting. Uh, I have had no experience with YouTube blocking any of my content at this point in time. So it'll be interesting if it happens. So I can't answer that question to, you know, what do you do? Um, yeah, my certainly my podcast has my own music, the intro music that someone wrote for me, and I've had no problems with iTunes. Great questions. So once again, repurpose your content, create a podcast series, burn to audio CDs, and then that's available to give away to people uh, or to sell. And once again, convert to an online course. So that's repurposing your content. That's my my website. I'm not sure why that's there. 
basically I think that is all the content that I had to cover in terms of uh, how to present virtually. Um, once again, the webinar came out of helping people that had information, had passion, had ideas they wanted to share, but due to difficulty, uh, time constraints, inability to travel, they weren't able to get before the audience. So this, the purpose of this webinar was to give you some ideas of how you can get your content, your message out. Um, I create a lot of content and I have lots of people that follow me on Facebook and my blog and I'm sharing the content virtually without me actually presenting. So that was kind of the purpose of this webinar. Uh, I've got some upcoming workshops in Perth next week, in Caratha early August and once again in Perth. Uh, I don't have any trips scheduled for Melbourne at the moment but would be keen to get over to Victoria um, sort of mid to late August or uh, in September if there is a need for some workshops over there. If you want the recording or if you have any additional questions after the webinar is complete, then please you know, feel free to send me an email and I'll, I'm quite happy to chase something up. So I may try and find out about YouTube blocking and then I can get back to you on that if, if you are interested. So for my workshops, you can always find them on my website and I've got two more webinars coming up. In, um, in July and August, so once again just go to my website if you're interested in these free webinars and if I can be of any other assistance please let me know. And a couple of questions coming in, what different techniques in speaking terms do you use remotely as opposed to in person? I guess when I'm running the webinar and you really can't see this, but I'm doing exactly the same gestures, uh, the same body language that I would be doing when I'm presenting live. People that are coached and trained as telemarketers and when you speak on the telephone, you should also gesture, you should also smile, you should do all the normal things you do when you're presenting. Uh, in terms of audio visuals, it, Try and get PowerPoint slides that are not too noisy and what I often do is I will f follow up when I'm presenting virtually with a link to a YouTube video or a TED video. So one of the webinars that I do is the, the importance of non-verbal communication and I can describe stuff and I can show some pictures but what I refer people to do after the webinar is I give them a link to Michael Grinder and he's got a whole YouTube video series on nonverbal communication and I then also refer people to um, a, a TED talk by Amy Cuddy, A-I-M-E-E, -E, first name and then surname Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y on the importance of nonverbal communication. So these people can now go and watch those presentations live and see what I'm speaking about in the webinar. So sometimes you have to do some follow-up and uh, provide additional resources that complement your, your virtual presentation. So great, great question. But generally I would act as if I'm it's as if I'm there in the room. So my energy level, my enthusiasm, my non-verbal communication, uh, my smiling, all of that still needs to be present when I'm doing an audio recording. Also, don't go robotic. Don't read a script. So this webinar, uh, I have not read the script. There is no script. None of my webinars have scripts. And that's why if you are going to convert it to a some sort of written format, make sure you you edit it after someone's transcribed it for you because your your idiosyncrasies, your you know verbal um, muck-ups will be written. So you need to have a look at that 
and just edit the document. So, yeah, don't script it, don't uh, read it would be one thing that I would also recommend. And try and be natural. Sometimes you throw a microphone, and this is Peter Dew speaking. I'm really pleased to be here today, and I'm going to talk to you about overcoming your fear of public speaking. No, don't do that. Just do your normal, genuine self, the way you are when you present live. You've just got a microphone and you're now recording it. I hope that helps, guys. Um, I'm going to end there because that's really all the content I've got. Um, I don't mind ending a, f ending a few minutes early. If there are any last questions, please, please let me know now. Otherwise, feel free to send me an email uh, if you'd like any further questions. Thanks, everyone. Message to Julian, which proved to answer my emails, please. Do you have recommendations around ebook software? Mm. Thanks for the question, Julie. Ebook software. Is there software for creating ebooks? Yeah, okay, or apps. No knowledge of ebook software. I've got a couple of ebooks on my website. I've just written them myself and, and then outsourced it. So I've written a Word document and then sent it off to someone on Elance and they've sent back an ebook and it's just ready to go. Uh, white papers are s s uh, shorter ebooks, five to six pages. So I'm unaware of apps or software that you can use to create an ebook. Uh, th there may be some formulas and some tips on writing ebooks out there, but I think any of your content you can convert to an ebook, and you can you can fairly well do it yourself, especially if you're giving it away. If you're going to sell your ebooks, maybe you need you know some professional help. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'm going to end it there.